Hello and good afternoon and very uh, a warm welcome to to this today's webinar. We just started and uh, just while letting all members join. Um, I hope you can hear me well and see us and uh, yeah, thanks for the interest in the topic and thanks for joining and so we will have the next hour. Uh, covering this topic uh, with a half hour presentation and then we have time for discussions and we also have a discussant uh, uh, very suitable to this topic so looking forward to the next hour my name is uh, Johannes Emmerling I'm a senior researcher at RFF CMCC in Milan and we organized this uh, webinar series now since quite a while and this one is actually a webinar within the Navigate project. I will talk just one minute about it. And um, yeah, we have many other webinars uh, here at CMCC that you can find on the website as well. But I think, yeah, now we should, uh, most people should be here. So let's officially start. Uh, welcome again for, for, for joining this webinar on, on the paper actually, and presented by Bjorn Sörgel from PIC in Potsdam. Uh, entitled A Sustainable Development Pathway for Climate Action Within the UN 2030 Agenda. And so Bjorn uh, will pre be presenting the, the paper and we have also Shonali uh, Pachauri here from IASA who has been working uh, on these topics of um, institutional social dimensions of, of the energy transition. And we're very happy that she accepted to, to join to, to give a discussion on this topic. But uh, just uh, for two minutes, uh, very briefly. So uh, we are here at the RFF CMCC, European Institute on Economics and the Environment which is a uh, uh, partnership between the US and Europe, uh, specifically between CMCC in, in Italy and Resources for the Future. And we are focusing on these topics on, on the linkages between economics, uh, climate and the environment in particular. So this, uh, this topic is also very uh, much of interest to us. This webinar is, is, be, is, be, is being organized within a series of webinars actually within a project that has been uh, financed by the European Commission uh, entitled Navigate, which is about the next generation or development of, of integrated assessment models to, to support climate policy um, um, in Europe and but also globally. It is a project that is, uh, has a lot of institutions around Europe and also two non-European um, countries. And it focuses on two, two main topics, which are both relevant today, I think. One is the systems perspective. So we inform, uh, it focuses on the technological dimension of, of how decarbonization and, and the transformation to a, a carbon neutral economy can, can happen on the supply side and also on the demand side, especially how consumer goods and services demand, um, how this transformation will, will look like and, and can look like in, in this transition. The second dimension, however, is a more social dimension, the, the people dimension, where we focus on the, the role of spatial and social heterogeneity, inequality and poverty, but also the role of impacts from climate, which are more and more becoming relevant in this, in this, um, in this literature, in this field of science, uh, co-benefits and also links to other dimensions of, uh, of development, especially here also the, the SDGs. And this is specifically uh, where this uh, semi webinar today sits in. Um, just a, a couple of remarks. So, um, as you know, webinars are typically that uh, the, the video and audio are deactivated for, for participants. After the seminar, you can, however, you can or write in the Q&A section your question already during the presentation, and I will then present them to, to the speaker or the discussant. There's also the opportunity to raise your hand if you want to want, want to ask your question um, uh, by, a, by a voice, and I will then give you the floor to, 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 to raise questions. Um, but with that being said, just a final remark, this video is uh, recorded and we will then also upload it on YouTube uh, once uh, on the YouTube channel that you can find here and also the Navigate website. But with that being said, let's uh, go directly to, to the talk uh, by Bjorn Sörgel. And um, yeah, so as, as I said, Bjorn Sörgel is, is a researcher at the uh, Potsdam Institute on Climate Impact Research. And he has been working a lot on, on modeling, combining it with assessment of inequality, poverty, and multidimensional welfare. Um, so uh, big topics that he's, he's tackling, and we're very happy to see his talk today. 
Uh, luckily, he's he's trained as an astrophysicist, so he knows how things that let's seem far away uh, are actually interrelated and can be. So uh, maybe that helps in in studying these questions. Um, yeah, thanks again, Bjorn, for accepting. And you have half an hour for the talk. Um, and then I will give you five minutes heads up maybe before before then moving to the journal for the discussion. If you can share the screen, then yeah. uh, that seems to work. Here we go. Can you see my slides and can you hear me all right? Perfect. Thanks. Wonderful. Yeah, thanks a lot, Johannes, for the nice introduction and also for having me at this webinar. So I will talk about how we can bring together climate action with the much broader agenda of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And this talk is based on a paper that we published in Nature Climate Change uh, two months ago. You can find the link at the bottom of this first slide. And this is work done in collaboration with many colleagues here from PIC, um, including Elmar Kriegler, who is also heading the Navigate project, uh, Isabel Weindel, Sebastian Rauner, and many others. So I'm sure many of you will know this picture uh, from the moment when the Paris Agreement was finalized. Was not every, uh, what not everyone knows immediately is that the Paris Agreement really strongly puts uh, climate action also in the context of sustainable development and poverty eradication. So this phrase sustainable development efforts to eradicate poverty pops up at multiple places in the text of the Paris Agreement. And vice versa, the UN Sustainable Development Goals explicitly contain climate action um, as one goal as SDG 13. And so both of these were uh, agreed upon in 2015. So I think it's really helpful to think of them not as two separate international agreements, but as really more an intertwined agenda. And in this spirit, um, it's important to look at the many interconnections between climate action and other SDGs. So here I took this from a perspective by Fuso Narini et al. What they did is for every SDG and all the targets contained in, in this SDG, they looked at whether it's positively affected by climate action, then you call it a synergy and they colored it in green, or whether it's negatively affected uh, by climate action, then you call it a trade-off and they colored it in this reddish color. Um, and you can see, uh, first of all, that essentially all SDGs are affected in one way or the other by climate action. There's no single SDG, um, which is completely white. Um, and you can also see that there are many uh, synergies, but there are also a couple of trade-offs. For example, here, if you look at poverty eradication, there are, in fact, both synergies and trade-offs. And it's the same for a number of other SDGs as well. So this is really just to illustrate um, that we need to think about um, a big interconnected agenda here. So let's have a look where we actually stand. Um, so both the Paris Agreement and the SDGs were formulated in 2015. So we are a bit more than a third um, already until 2030. So, um, so good time for first stock take. And unfortunately, um, the conclusion of that stock take, I'm going to give that away already in advance, is that we are not on track towards these targets. If you look on the climate side, um, um, you can take this figure from the climate action tracker. If you take the current policies, then we're heading for uh, nearly three degrees of warming by the end of the century. If you figure in the current pledges, then it's 2.4 degrees, but you're still far away from the one and a half degree goal of the Paris Agreement. And in fact, that's just one um, area. If you broaden um, the scope a little bit and you think about other environmental goals um, and take the planetary boundaries as a concept for doing so, um, you can see that also in many other areas, um, we're heading into what you might call the danger zone. So um, for example, in the area of biodiversity integrity, uh, we are already in this red zone, which is the beyond uncertainty or high risk zone in the language of the planetary boundaries. The same for biochemical flows, phosphorus, and nitrogen, and so on. So that's, again, stressing the point um, that we need to worry not just about the climate, but also about this much broader perspective, other environmental goals. And in fact, um, I think the big merit of the SDGs is also to bring in the social goals um, and to bring together this environmental and the social um, agenda. And also here, unfortunately, um, the stock take tells us that we are not on track towards the targets. So this figure is that from another paper that we published earlier this year, 
uh, where we made a projection for extreme poverty rates. So that's the fraction of the population below $1.90 per day in 2030 if you continue with current trends. Um, so that's actually still pre-COVID. And what we found is that um, 350 million people would be left in extreme poverty by 2030, even without the effect of COVID. With COVID, it would likely even be more. So that's, again, not on track. Um, and you can do the same with a more multidimensional perspective. This is from a recent paper um, by Yamo Kikstra and colleagues, where they did an assessment of energy requirements for um, many different categories for decent living standards. And the darker the shading is here in their map, the bigger the gap uh, towards decent living standards is. And so this is currently, and if you project that out to 2030, again, you come to the same point that um, you're not on track towards meeting the targets of the SDGs. So far on the status quo, um, looking forward, uh, what we try to do in this study is to construct what we call a sustainable development pathway. So you can think of this really as a target seeking scenario um, where you think about where you want to be at the end point and you try to find the measures, the policy interventions that will get you there. Of course, 2030 is very close. Um, so fully meeting the SDGs by 2030 um, is going to be very challenging, but we wanted to see at least as much progress as still possible until 2030. And then it's important not to stop at 2030, but also to look towards 2050 and beyond, as nicely illustrated by this figure from the world in 2050, um, and even longer to, in the long term, meet the climate targets of the Paris Agreement, and of course also to respect the planetary boundaries for the other environmental indicators. And we try to um, build this into a scenario framework that takes the SSPs, the shared socioeconomic pathways, that I think most of you will be familiar with as a starting point, but then adds towards uh, the sustainable development pathway. So we started from a scenario which simply extrapolates current trends and policy actions. So in the language of the SSPs, that's SSP2 um, and NDC for the nationally determined contributions, so weak climate policies. The first step in this scenario cascade um, is focusing mainly on human development, so education, gender equality, also faster economic development, better institutions, and we also bundled this with resource efficiency, um, and that basically takes you from an SSP2 world to an SSP1 world, so the more sustainable scenario in the SSP framework. Then, of course, a very important component is climate action. So that's why the next intervention is um, climate action um, in order to reach the one and a half degree goal from the Paris Agreement. And that takes you to this SSP1, one and a half degree scenario. And in fact, if you look into the literature, many studies kind of stop here, uh, taking this SSP1, one and a half degree scenario as the sustainable scenario. But in fact, if you quantify um, SDG outcomes for the scenario, what you find is that you're still very far away from the ambition of the SDGs. And that's why in the study, um, we thought about the additional interventions, the missing measures that will get you from this just SSP1 um, climate scenario to what you might call a more holistic sustainable development policy approach. And again, we bundled these interventions into three categories. Um, one is food and energy, one is global equity, and one is equality and poverty alleviation. And I will explain in much more detail what is in these interventions in a moment. Let me also briefly introduce the model framework that we used for the study. So that's the Remind Magpie IAM framework that I'm sure many of you have heard about in previous presentations, maybe also in the Navigate context. It consists of two models, uh, the Remind model, um, is at its core a macroeconomic optimal growth model, which is hard linked to a very detailed representation of the energy system. And on the Magpie side, um, we have a spatially explicit um, optimal land use allocation model. And these two models can exchange information. Um, most importantly, Remind informs Magpie about the price um, for CO2 and other greenhouse gases and the demand for bioenergy in the energy system. 
and Magpie, vice versa, informs Remind about the emissions from the land use side and the price for bioenergy. And you iterate this until you reach a joint equilibrium. And I'm stressing this because um, if you want to have this more holistic sustainable development perspective, then it's of course very important to have these different interlinkages between the energy system and the land use system taken into account. A few further notes on the model. Um, so we work with 12 regions. Um, what that means is that large countries like the US, India, China, or Japan are model regions in their own right, and smaller countries are grouped together into macro regions. And the climate policy setting that we used in the study is that the policy starts after 2020 with a period of staged accession, which means that high income countries start with a fairly high carbon price and low income countries gradually converge to that price level by 2050. And I'll get back to that point later on. But of course, just Remind Magpie is insufficient for um, a full SDG assessment. And that's why we supplemented um, this core framework with many individual sub-models for additional SDGs. Um, so for example, we have one post-processing model for inequality and poverty indicators, another one for air pollution health effects. We have an earth system of intermediate complexity with a detailed ocean component that we used for calculating the ocean indicators. Um, and we also collaborated with political scientists from the German Development Institute um, to get an assessment of institutional quality and conflict likelihood along these scenarios. And so with this, what we tried to do was really to quantify indicators or at least meaningful proxies for all 17 SDGs. And I think we, we succeeded in doing that. So I'm not going to walk you through all these panels in detail. Um, what I do want to highlight is that we really have all SDGs covered. Um, so here I grouped them um, in, in five clusters. One is planetary integrity. Um, one is provision of material needs, people, prosperity, and political institutions, peace and partnership. And this clustering is, by the way, inspired by the target space paper led by Detlef van Poel, that some of you will know. So here I'm just showing one or at most two indicators. We call them headline indicators in the paper um, to be representative of the full SDG coverage in the paper itself. And especially in the supplement, we have much more detail. In total, we cover nearly 60 SDG indicators. And I also want to highlight that there are a couple of indicators that are not so standard yet. Um, for example, the ocean acidification, or we have multiple ocean uh, indicators. Here I'm showing ocean acidification with the uh, aragonite saturation state. Um, we have biodiversity intactness indicators, um, poverty and air pollution health effects, and also, as already mentioned, these in, uh, indicators for conflict likelihood or peace and institutional quality. So let me now come back to these interventions that I mentioned before, and starting with intervention D, which is food and energy. Um, so here, one thing is important that um, we implemented these interventions in a couple of different ways, um, depending on um, what exactly the topic is. So some of them are implemented through scenario assumptions. Others are really part of the endogenous model dynamics, and yet others we implemented as policies, for example, through a constraint in the model. And that's why I put these slightly cryptic abbreviations here behind each individual part of the intervention with the legend here at the bottom to give you a bit of a feeling for how exactly this is represented in the model. So on the food side, uh, this is actually part of the scenario assumptions. We assumed a transition to zero hunger by 2050, but taking into account the extra food demand, especially in developing countries, required for this. And we also assume that diets gradually shift to uh, more healthy and sustainable diets um, according to the Eat Lancet recommendations. And again, this is a gradual transition by 2050. On the energy side, we took inspiration from these decent living standards work. Um, I showed the one by Yamo before, and there's other work also by, by many colleagues at YASA. Um, telling you how much energy per capita is needed for a minimum living standard. And we try to reflect this in the energy demand assumptions for developing regions that we used in the scenario. Um, 
And on the other hand, looking towards the high income regions, um, we assumed um, an ambitious reduction in energy consumption per capita, which can be achieved through a combination of both efficiency and sufficiency measures. And last but not least, there are many additional sustainability policies, both in the energy and the land system that we pulled together, for example, a coal phase out for um, reducing air pollution health effects, um, a limit on bioenergy and CCS, uh, protection of biodiversity hotspots and many, many others. So with this um, setup that I showed before, we can now actually take apart the effects of the different interventions. Um, so I have multiple of these plots here, we call them waterfall plots. So let me just briefly explain before I go into the content how these plots work. The first bar is always the value of the indicator in 2015, so kind of the status quo uh, when the Paris Agreement and the SDGs were agreed. The second bar um, is the trend until 2030, um, so the red step is showing you the change from 2050 to 2030. Then the yellow step is um, faster human development and resource efficiency, so that's the SSP1 world. Green is the effect of climate policy and blue are these additional SDG interventions. And I now group this here. You have all SDG interventions bundled together, but the main effect, of course, here is coming from the food side. So what you can see here in the left panel is um, the number of people that are underweight, so with the body mass index um, below a certain threshold. And this is actually something that is part of the scenario assumptions. As I said before, we assume that underweight is eradicated by 2050. And it, in 2030, you're on the way of doing that. On the right hand side, you can actually see an endogenous model result, the food price index. And here it's interesting to see that there is a substantial trade off of climate policy. So um, just climate policy without the additional sustainable development interventions makes food more expensive. Um, but the additional sustainable development interventions, especially here also the dietary uh, change, um, essentially entirely compensates this trade-off of climate policy. And that's, of course, the affordability of food, um, very important for low-income countries and especially low-income households in low-income countries. Let's have a look at a few selected indicators for the food and land use system as well. So there's a lot of information in this plot here. I'm just going to pick out a few things for you. So I'm showing here four regions, two low-income regions, Sub-Saharan Africa and India, and two high-income regions, uh, the EU and the US. Um, the, the vertical bar in this plot is always the value in 2015. Then the wider transparent bar is the value in 2030, and the solid um, thin bar is the value in 2050. And if you look at the left-hand panel, um, you can see the land use emissions uh, of non-CO2 gases, so methane and nitrous oxide. And what you can see is that especially this change in diets really drastically reduces the non-CO2 emissions from land use. And that's important because that actually gives a little bit more leeway on the CO2 side. So what we found is that increases the one and a half degree compatible CO2 budget by roughly 100 gigatons. On the right hand side, you can see the food expenditures. Um, so that's, uh, we show this as a share of GDP, and you can take this as a proxy for food affordability. And especially if you look at Sub Saharan Africa, you can see that initially their expenditure share is very high. It decreases in all scenarios, but especially so in the sustainable development scenario. And that underpins this assumption of. Um, radically reducing underweight and eradicating it by 2050. Again, taking a bit of a broader perspective uh, towards the planetary boundaries, we also quantified um, a number of indicators relevant to that. So here from left to right, you have agricultural water use, uh, nitrogen fixation, and biodiversity intactness. And the dashed line here in these plots that's essentially the target that we took from the planetary boundaries. And so what you can see is that these additional sustainability interventions, the dietary change, and the land system sustainability policies in this case, really um, enable you to bring the food and land use system more or less back in line with the planetary boundaries. So agricultural water use goes below the threshold, 
nitrogen fixation is reduced drastically and nearly um, to the sustainable threshold and similarly for biodiversity impactness. So let's move on to the energy side. What I'm showing here on the left is the useful energy um, for buildings and mobility in low income countries. Sorry for the abbreviation here. Um, and we're using useful energy because uh, that's a better proxy for the actual energy service than final energy, because you've already accounted for the, the conversion efficiency. And again, you can see that there's a trade-off, small trade-off associated with climate policy, which is more than compensated by these additional sustainability policies. Again, the left here is mostly driven by the assumptions. Um, so um, again, in low-income countries, that we take into account how much energy is roughly required for decent living standards. On the right-hand side, the final energy price is an endogenous response of the model. And again, you can see the, the trade-off associated with climate policies. That's mostly carbon pricing, making energy more expensive. Um, and this trade-off is at least partially compensated by these additional sustainability interventions, not entirely in this case, though. Again, let's have a look at some more details of the energy system. So in the middle plot, I'm showing now final energy per capita. Um, and here you can at least to some extent see um, this convergence in energy use between low income countries and high income countries. If you first look at the uh, black bars for 2015, you can see that there's a huge, uh, huge gap between per capita energy consumption in low income and in high income countries. And over time, um, this gap is reduced um, by an increase in energy consumption per capita in low income countries and a big decrease, especially in the sustainable scenario um, in high income countries. So, for example, Europe cutting it, um, the energy consumption per capita in half and the US in, by more than half by 2050. On the right hand side, I'm showing again the expenditure share for final energy. Again, that's a proxy for energy affordability. And here in this case, we can actually see some sort of trade off. So if you assume that more energy is needed in low income countries, then that also pushes up their final energy expenditure share. So for example, for sub Saharan Africa, you can see that it increases from the 2015 value by quite a bit. And um, also here looking for India here, the increase is even starker um, for the 2030, because here you also have effects like um, phasing out coal more rapidly, um, making energy more expensive in the near term. But that's more of a transition effect. If you look to 2050, you can see that you're for India below the current value of the 2015 value. And it's important to note that we also have an international climate policy dimension, which I'm going to speak about next, which also compensates these sort of trade-offs. So this is basically uh, the next topic, the next intervention. So um, intervention E, we call global equity. Um, and this consists mostly of international redistribution of part of the carbon pricing revenues. So we made the assumption that part, uh, one third of the carbon pricing revenues goes into an international pot. And that international pot is then distributed to countries um, so that poorest countries are the largest beneficiaries. And we call that not just climate finance, but climate and development finance, um, because we want to stress that um, with this, you can actually link international climate finance also to development policies like poverty eradication. And intervention F um, is basically the counterpart on the national level. So we assume that at the national level, the remaining carbon pricing revenues and also what is received as international transfers is redistributed as an equal per capita climate dividend. And that puts lower income households better off because they tend to have lower carbon footprints. So that means for them, the climate dividend is larger than their burden for the carbon pricing. So here in the middle panel, I'm showing the international climate finance transfers. So we designed this such that you actually really go beyond this $100 billion uh, per year commitment. Because if you think not just about climate finance, but really about climate and development finance, thinking of the SDGs as a global agenda and global support for meeting this agenda, that's what is needed. And 
Here, Sub-Saharan Africa and India are the largest beneficiaries of this scheme. So the bar goes to the right for them. Um, and Europe and the US and the other industrialized countries um, are the largest contributors. So that's why that's shown negatively here. And in terms of numbers, um, in 2030, um, the net international climate and development transfers would be in the ballpark of $300 billion per year. And we actually factored that in when calculating policy costs. Uh, that's what you can see on the right here. So I take relative GDP change. Um, so with respect to a reference scenario, asymmetric for policy costs here. And you can see that especially for Sub-Saharan Africa, there's actually, at least in the short term, an increase of GDP um, because they are beneficiaries of these international redistribution schemes. And I also wanted to come back to the uh, carbon price briefly, because in this figure, you can actually see two important things. Uh, the first one, if you compare the transparent 2030 bar here for Sub-Saharan Africa and India to the ones for Europe and the US, um, you can see again this carbon price differentiation. So low income countries starting with a low carbon price initially, and then gradually by 2050 converging to the same carbon price as high income countries. And the second bit you can see here is that um, if you compare the blue, the sustainable scenario with this um, just mitigation scenario, um, that the carbon price required to meet the one and a half degree target is reduced roughly um, by one half. And that again is important, especially um, for reducing policy costs in developing countries. So let's come back to inequality and poverty. So look at the result of these interventions. Um, on the left hand side, I'm showing the relative poverty rate. So that's an indicator for inequality within countries defined as the fraction of the population that is below 50% of the national median income. And here I'm showing the global population weighted average of that. And again, you can see that there's a trade-off of climate policies. So poverty rate, relative poverty rate increased because of the reg regressive incidence of carbon pricing um, through both energy prices and food prices. And these additional sustainable development policies, so both the national and the international redistribution schemes um, way more than compensate this increase in inequality. And it's similar if you look to the right-hand side for extreme poverty, there's a trade-off associated with climate policy, but the additional sustainability and development policies more than compensate that. So to round this off, let's take a step back. Um, I talked now a lot about the individual interventions. Um, let's try to look at all SDGs together again. Um, so the individual symbols are again showing the headline indicators that you can see listed here on the left for the individual SDGs. Um, and I'm focusing just on two scenarios here, the sustainable development scenario in blue and the trends continued scenario in red. And the way to read this plot here is that at zero, that's the 2015 value. Um, and 100% means that you completely achieved the SDG. Um, looking on the left hand side by 2030 and on the right hand side by 2050. So there's a couple of things to take away from this SDG index kind of plot. The first and maybe most obvious thing is that the sustainable development scenario really substantially improves over the reference scenario in essentially all SDG categories. Um, however, uh, because of the short time horizon until 2030, um, for most indicators, you're not actually meeting the target until 2030. However, if you look to the right-hand side um, for 2050, you can see that if you pursue these policies also after 2030, then you can close many of these gaps and in fact meet or almost meet many of these sustainable development goals. We also did such an assessment at the regional level. So again, there's a lot to unpack here. Um, First of all, we again grouped the um, different indicators according to these five clusters. Um, so uh, planet, provision, people, prosperity, and political institutions. And each one of these circles stands for one of these clusters. And then each segment within one of these circles is one individual SDG. 
So if the if the segment is completely white, that means um, you're in a very bad state for that respective SDG. If the segment is completely colored in the color of that respective SDG, like here this uh, bright blue for SDG six for water, um, that means you have completely achieved that respective SDG. And there's of course a lot in here. Um, let me maybe just distill one insight. If you again compare the high income countries like the EU and the US with the low income countries, what you typically find is that the high income countries like here, the EU tend to perform very well on the, um, on the more social indicators like the eradication of poverty, but um, not so well on the more environmental indicators. And it's, a bit the other way around for the lower income countries, which um, perform better on the environmental side and not so good on the more socially oriented SDGs. So what that highlights is that even in this very optimistic scenario, um, you still have gaps in 2030. Um, and it's not that just the low income countries have the gaps and it's all fine in the high income countries, but really all countries or regions need to develop in a certain direction even after 2030. We did the same exercise also for 2050. So I hope you can also see this now well. If I flick a little bit between these, um, then the difference that you can see is the extra progress between 2030 and 2050, where you can see that many of these segments move to being more closed than before or completely closed. So with this, um, let me wrap things up. I hope that was okay with the time. So the first point that we try to make with this paper is that the um, classic interventions that we already had in the scenario literature, like development, resource efficiency, fairly moderate lifestyle change and climate policies are actually really insufficient if you compare them to the ambition of the sustainable development goals. And that's why these additional SDG interventions are needed and we group them into these areas of global cooperation, for example, with this climate and development scheme, um, national redistributed policies, which can be funded from the carbon pricing revenues. Um, and by this also creating a sort of policy linking where you link the environmental or climate policies also to the social policies, actually both at the international and at the national level. And then of course, importantly, also food and energy and here, one important takeaway is really how large the co-benefits of healthy and sustainable diets are. And you, as you probably know, you can motivate these diets um, like the Eat Lancet recommendations purely on health reasons. And then you get these huge co-benefits uh, for climate, land, water, the nitrogen cycle, biodiversity, and so on. And if you throw all of this together, then you can get really substantial improvements towards nearly all SDGs. Um, but as I said before, um, in 2030, because of the short time horizon, you still have gaps. Many of these can then be closed by 2050. So I'll stop here and I look forward to Shonali's discussion of the paper and also to your questions afterwards. Thanks very much. Thanks, uh, Bjorn. Perfect timing, actually. So no, no worries. Thanks for a, a great, a great presentation on and, and really wide uh, <laughs> angle, let's say. And so let's maybe first have yeah, the discussion by Shonali. If, if you're here, I think, yeah, it's given that you have a lot of expertise on these topics, it would be great to hear your comments on, on the talk. Thanks very much. Thanks, Johannes, and thanks, Bjorn, for this excellent presentation and uh, this really great piece of work. I, I first want to congratulate you uh, on this uh, really seminal piece of work. And I know uh, an effort that must have taken years and many, many people. Um, so I think it's really uh, exciting to see this work. Uh, I mean, I, I want to start with sort of like three things that I see as the main contributions of this work. So one is, of course, uh, it's really integrating these very different dimensions of the sustainable development goals and then trying to really bridge the SDG and Paris Agreement agendas to look at these kind of interconnectedly, which I think is the way it should be. Um, uh, the second is also really providing this kind of broad quantitative framework uh, 
for considering the interactions between different dimensions. Uh, and I know this has been done in a piecemeal manner in different aspects, but kind of trying to bring all of these things together, I think is, uh, I mean, of course, something that this is a starting point for, but is really nice to, to see it in some ways being done together. And then uh, finally, I think the third big contribution of this work is also really um, uh, twofold. One is sort of bringing in the policy dimension of ways of sort of going beyond the what if to how to, uh, but then also, um, uh, you know, thinking about additional indicators, because we know that the indicator set for the SDGs, for instance, is not perfect. There are many things that are missed. And so sort of looking beyond the, the existing indicator sets, I see as a, also a big contribution of this. Um, in terms of um, the discussion, I'd, I'd like to kind of frame these again uh, around three broad areas. and. I'm happy to actually engage in a discussion with you Bjorn on, on some of these things. So uh, the way I see it as um, the challenges with this work uh, are kind of, there are many, but uh, the th three key ones that I see are one internal consistency. So for instance, what I mean by that is, of course, the, the STB scenario is normatively defined clearly, and you're assuming the achievement of certain goals. That's the definition of the scenario. Um, and, and of course, this is clearly, you know, as you explained already uh, earlier, either based on exogenous assumptions of achieving the goal or in some ways um, policy or then sort of constraints in the models, right? Um, but for instance, I mean, just as a simple example, uh, you know, when we talk about poverty alleviation, which is something that you're trying to achieve with one of the, the goals, uh, this obviously has implications for educational attainment, for uh, health, for, you know, nutrition, for, for material demands, and so on and so forth, uh, for various different things. And, and that's what I mean by internal consistency. So th that's one area where I see, of course, there is uh, much more that can be done. And, and also I would like to hear more from you on what your thinking was when you were sort of uh, deciding about um, the various scenarios and, and uh, whether this was something that was considered at all and to what extent. Uh, then the second, um, second area, which I think is also interesting to explore a little bit further is the extent to which heterogeneity was accounted for in the work, right? So, I mean, of course you have within uh, the model 12 regions uh, and then there were some indicators and some dimensions where you're doing the analysis at the national level, uh, but also to the extent possible cons considering intranational uh, inequalities and so on and so forth. But of course, we know that um, these kind of aggregates or averages don't always reflect the extent of heterogeneity, whether you're talking about spatial heterogeneity or socioeconomic heterogeneity, this is quite wide. Uh, and uh, I just wanted to sort of get a sense also from you in to the extent to which you think uh, heterogeneity matters in certain dimensions more than maybe in others, and to what extent uh, future work might consider additional heterogeneities uh, in, in sort of developing this further. Uh, and then the last uh, point that I'd like to sort of structure the discussion around is uh, something that we are all dealing with today, which is basically the fact that in our um, business as usual, or sort of uh, trends as usual uh, set up, uh, we, we haven't considered the pandemic or shocks that follow from the pandemic or additional shocks that we may still have to deal with uh, two years or five years down the line. Uh, and so, um, uh, of course, we are already seeing literature coming out that's telling us that the 
aftermath of the pandemic is going to make achieving many of these goals much more challenging. Uh, and um, uh, I know that work of your own, to some extent, has also been looking at sort of how um, not only climate financing, but maybe also some of the uh, funds that are now being proposed for building back from the pandemic could be used to really achieving also SDGs and the climate goals. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I, I, I'd, I'd be interested in sort of discussing a little bit further with you how you think the pandemic is affecting uh, achievement of the goals for one thing, and then also how one could in future work consider resilience of um, society to such shocks like the pandemic and others possibly. Um, so, I mean, I, 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 these were kind of like the key points that I thought about as we were, uh, as I read the paper and as I was listening to your talk now, and I'd be really interested in hearing uh, your responses on some of this uh, and possibly uh, your thoughts about future work on these, in these directions. Thanks very much, Shonadi. Great, great points, I think. Um, yeah, maybe, Bjorn, if you have just a, a minute or two to, to respond to those. I'm sorry, we are a bit short of time. Um, but yeah, I think they are, they are all important topics. Maybe you can talk on all three for a minute or two. Then we have a couple of questions already from the audience. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'll try to be brief. Um, thanks a lot, Shonadi, for the, for the nice comments. And I agree with all three of your points. Um, so um, the first one on the... Uh, on the internal consistency, um, I think we tried to do it where it was possible, um, but you've mentioned some of these um, um, connections that we didn't yet take into account. So for example, um, education is something that our model doesn't speak to, so we worked with exogenous projections from the SSPs. Um, but I completely agree with you that in both directions, poverty eradication is a driver for improving education and vice versa. So in the future, um, I think it would be very nice to, to develop this in a better way. Um, I think in terms of energy footprints, um, at least moving people from below the $1.90 line to the $1.90 line, I think is not going to make a drastic difference. Of course, if you go beyond the $1.90 line, then also the feedback of taking people out of poverty is going to matter much more um, for energy and food demands. And that's again, something that we would like to take into account better in the future. Um, and I think that connects also to your second point on heterogeneity. Um, so as you said, for the poverty and inequality calculations, we really did it at the country level and really took into account the distribution. Um, for example, for food and energy, um, we haven't done it. And that's, again, something that um, I would like to extend in the future, where, for example, one could try to work also with um, within country distributions of energy consumption and of food consumption. And I think that would give a much richer picture also of um, energy poverty, food poverty, and so on. Um, and the final point on the pandemic, absolutely. I mean, if we'd started this, um, this work now, of course, we would be taking up the effects of the pandemic. Um, so I read one assessment by the World Bank, I think relatively early on, and their assessment was that in the near term, the pandemic increased uh, the number of people below this $1.90 line by around about 100 million people, depending on your exact assumptions about the economic shock and the distributional shock. Um, of course, if you look further into the future, then it becomes much harder um, because there's this big uncertainty how still, even from now on, the recovery will look like um, and what kind of long-term persistent effect of the pandemic will remain. Um, what we already have, and that's work by uh, Marian and colleagues, um, also in the context of Navigate, is new GDP scenarios that take up the pandemic shock and also make some assumptions about the recovery. So I think using that um, for the future would be at least one step in the right direction um, of better taking up the pandemic. But it's a big question, I fully agree with you. Thanks. Thanks. I think some good points, but yeah, some questions also remain. Um, speaking of questions, so let's maybe move to the audience. Uh, I, there are already a couple of questions in the chat, maybe starting out. Um, the first one about the 
the degree of um, optimism or pessimism in the scenario, um, whether you think that the assumptions are not maybe too optimistic to some, in, in some dimensions at least, um, or even unrealistic, of course, uh, hard to judge, but yeah, that's one question. I don't know yet what was the, the guiding uh, principle maybe in, in general. Yeah, that's, that's again a very good question. Um, so we try to be as optimistic as one could reasonably be, um, but um, of course not be completely unicorn-like. Um, so maybe one area for discussion here is, for example, the assumptions about, um, about dietary change. Um, of course, moving towards the Eat Lancet by 2050 is a very big assumption. And that is one that might uh, very likely not materialize ever in the real world. At the same time, the 30 year period is a long time. And I guess the pandemic also has shown us that if needed, things can change very quickly. So, but yeah, I agree with um, the question also and the way you asked it, Johannes, that it's very hard to judge um, what the right degree of realism or optimism is in these kind of assessments. Um, another question also in a bit towards the economic uh, structure. So um, how, um, how is the economy structure in the modeling approach? I mean, you talked a lot about uh, the, the energy system and, and other dimensions, but let's say about the sectoral economic representation. Um, what, how is that modeled? And related also, how is the, the, the dynamics work or how is the, the, the dynamics of all the variables in the model um, uh, implemented or run? Right, so the, um, the economic representation doesn't have a lot of detail. It's essentially a, um, an optimal growth Ramsey model with um, one uh, single production function um, that uh, takes up capital, labor, and final energy as input factors and produces aggregate GDP. So it's not a, a computable general equilibrium kind of setup where you have um, a rich basket of economic sectors. And so again, I guess that also goes in the direction of one of the points by Shonali is definitely an area where you could improve um, the heterogeneity, the granularity, also by having much more detail on the economic side, which allows you to tease out, uh, for example, also employment effects that we didn't have in the model and, and many other things. But unfortunately, that's, that's difficult with the setup that we currently have. Okay. Um... Thank you. Now I have a question on uh, on the carbon price. You, so you showed the carbon prices of, of around three hundred dollars. Um, yeah, but maybe um, and the pessimistic one of six hundred dollars. First of all, what was the unit of that? And second, yeah, I mean maybe can you comment on these these levels? And uh, a second, the different different question is on the, the poverty. So you look only at purely economic poverty, right? I mean the, the measure by by one point nine. Um, M dollars. Yeah, I mean, whether you also consider different, let's say, poverty concepts um, going beyond beyond pure material, uh, let's say, um, prosperity. Right on the on the carbon price unit is dollar two thousand five per ton CO two, um, and non CO two greenhouse gases are priced according to uh, global warming potential. Um, yeah, so the the carbon price level is determined endogenously by the model um, in order to meet the one and a half degree target. So we represent that by a CO2 budget. Um, and we make some assumptions also about the shape of the carbon price trajectory, but the level of the price um, is fixed by the model. And in this optimistic sustainable development scenario, um, one of the main drivers for having that lower carbon price is that you have these extra 100 gigatons um, because you reduce the non-CO2 greenhouse gases from the land use side so rapidly um, that you get a bit more leeway on the CO2 side. So that's one of the main drivers. Um, and on the poverty concept, so um, from the results I showed, that was indeed focusing on the $1.90 line. In the paper, in the supplement, we also have two additional poverty lines for 320 and 550. So these higher poverty lines used by the World Bank. And then um, we, of course, also look at um, other um, poverty indicators, uh, or multi more multidimensional poverty indicators, I think a bit more indirectly 
like um, the food price index or um, the fraction of the population that is malnourished um, or the energy prices. So I think we are not fully there yet that we can really do a full multi-dimensional poverty assessment along all of these dimensions. Um, as for example, Yamo held it in, uh, in the paper that I briefly showed in the introduction, but that's definitely also an interesting direction to pursue. Thanks. Okay, so if uh, several congratulations on, on a great paper. If um, uh, there's another question, then I will add my own. Um, uh, a question a bit on the cultural perspective, or let's say the, the different also cultural differences across uh, the globe and different countries. Um, yeah, this more a bit like social also cultural dimension. Is this somehow considered or would that matter or uh, how it could something like that be considered in, in a such very holistic approach like the one you've been using? Yeah, thanks. I think that's that's a tricky question. So um, with these integrated assessment models, especially if you use them with a global um, scope then of course your view is always very much top down and what we can do is calculate these kind of global benchmark policies um, saying if you want to meet one and a half degrees that's the best way of doing though these are the sdg side effects of doing so and these extra policies help you in meeting the sdgs along the side um, the the cultural perspective then i think is very important also in in the question how to implement this in the real world. And that's something that, um, of course, our model um, has difficulty speaking to. Again, maybe the, uh, the dietary change is a good example here. Um, that's basically something that we put in as an assumption. Um, but one step forward here would be to actually have this as part of more of the model dynamics and actually represent um, the dynamics that could lead to such dietary changes actually happening in the real world. And then uh, cultural aspects and the political economy also would play a big role. But we are definitely not there yet. We can't um, implement this at the moment. Maybe my uh, my question would go in, the, in a very similar direction, but a bit more to what is maybe doable. And that is the, the actual carbon pricing uh, in the world. I mean, we know that carbon prices are being more and more introduced. Uh, how, how did you specifically choose the carbon pricing across regions? Because we saw that it had a huge impact potentially on several of the indicators. So I was wondering if the carbon prices that were regionally uh, heterogeneous have had somehow uh, they're using including some real world data from the NDCs or from existing carbon pricing uh, schemes or how yeah and, and how are you realistic are the ones that you propose maybe think in exactly in, in terms of a political economy and different political institutions and and um, and also on the fairness consideration so I think it would be interesting to how you choose these um, different transfer and carbon pricing schemes across countries. Yeah, very good question as well. Um, so the carbon prices that we have in the model until 2020, these are actually uh, based on NDCs, so um, commitments of countries um, and then translated into a carbon price that would deliver that sort of emission reduction. Um, and then from um, after 2020 onwards, then we have this uh, transition towards a globally uniform carbon price and this is really um, defined mostly by an equity perspective. So the high income countries uh, start off with um, the full carbon price already. And then there's a reduction factor that depends um, on GDP per capita. Um, and so gradually that reduction factor converges to unity. Um, you can make many different choices here. Um, that's, that's for sure. And also for the, for the transfer scheme, uh, we tried to come up with one that we thought um, reflects the ambition, not just of international climate finance, but also the ambition of the SDGs um, for global cooperation for the goals. But again, it's, it's an, a scenario assumption, and I think you could rightly make also a different one here. Okay, um, maybe a, a final question, I think a, a great question. There is, of course, a lot of talk about net zero in the mission scheme, but zero hunger, arguably, uh, writes Alexander Colley here, uh, is maybe the most important uh, goal. Um, and do you have an idea from the, your scenarios, net zero hunger, when, it, when is it achieved in your, uh, if you assume that is, let's say, very, of course, one of the main goals uh, in your scenario, do you know more or less by what year uh, it can be expected to be achieved in the different scenarios? And do you have an idea? 
Um, so for the sustainable development scenario, we assume zero hunger by 2050. So that's a scenario assumption. Um, at some point, we also um, thought about using 2030, um, but that uh, we felt would actually have pushed um, beyond the frontier of what, what is realistic. Um, so um, for, for the other scenarios, um, we have um, basically um, the food consumption basket driven just by per capita income. And if you take the reference scenario, then um, you would have uh, hunger persisting well into the second half of the, um, of the 21st century. I don't know the exact number when you hit zero hunger from the top of my head, uh, but definitely way beyond 2050. I didn't quite understand the concept of net zero hunger though, because unlike no, sorry, for emissions, you, you can't really compensate there. No, of course not, not zero hunger, it's zero hunger, yes. Um, okay. Well, uh, uh, finishing a bit on a, on a, on a, a sad note, but uh, nevertheless, um, well, thanks a lot, uh, a lot for a great, uh, um, great, great talk. Uh, a lot of food for thought. No, no pun intended. Um, well, thanks a lot, Bjorn, and and thanks also, Shonali, for for your discussion and on a topic which I think will will certainly scientifically, but also in policy, uh, continue to to occupy many many of us and uh, for the for the coming years and decades. So thanks a lot, Bjorn, for this contribution. Uh, congratulations on the paper, and looking forward to see you uh, on another webinar um, on similar or related topics. And uh, yeah, thanks for all the the great questions. Questions and, and interest and a lot of participation actually. And uh, yeah, thanks from my side and have a nice rest of your day. Yeah, thanks a lot to you, Johannes, also, and to Shonali again and to everyone for the great questions. Thank you. Great, great presentation, great discussion. Thank you very much.